research traineeship called the Circularity Impact Program. And this program is designed for students who, graduate students who are studying policy in STEM fields and researching the circular use of water, energy, or materials. And circularity can be a really broad topic. Um, we have many different viewpoints and approaches within our cohort of students and faculty. Um, but the goal is to design and implement technology and policy and work with communities to reduce waste and shift away from a linear flow of resources to a circular flow. Um, so in today's panel, we are going to be running a Q&A session with some questions that our students have prepared. And we welcome questions from the audience. Um, please direct your question, if applicable, to one or two people just in the nature of time. And we're really excited to have everyone here. Um, so I'd like to welcome our distinguished guests, Beth Tomlinson from Stantec, Della Young from the Young Environmental Consulting Group, Michelle Stockness from Freshwater Society, and Sam Hansen from the Ramsey Washington County Recycling and Energy Board. Please welcome them. Our first question is for all four panelists. Um, if you could please, in two or three minutes. Um, if you could please share in two or three minutes your career path and how your work strives for a more circular economy. Good morning, everyone. Beth Tomlinson with Stantec. I am a discipline leader at Stantec in our Booleans business line. I am in charge of the carbon and climate discipline, which is also sustainability. Um, my career, I am a mechanical engineer by training and by practice. I think this is the first year I have not signed construction drawings. Uh, as I've moved into this role, I'm more of thought leadership of what we need to do at Stantec to comply with industry expectations for sustainability, uh, ESG reporting, uh, project alignment, and educational outreach. Uh, I would say that when I first started in mechanical engineering, I did not know what to do. So I joined the Peace Corps and I taught science for a while. And when I came back, I knew that occupant health was really important to me. So I joined the construction world for building design, focusing on indoor air quality, and then realizing that you can pay for indoor air quality through energy efficiency savings and worked into the world of energy conservation, climate change mitigation, I've been here to speak on climate adaptation, so that's also a hat that I wear. Um, and now and now I'm trying to change the building industry for the better for circular economy considerations, and I can talk about that a little bit later. Thank you very much. I'm Della Shaw Young, <clears throat> the owner and principal hydrologist with Young Environmental Consulting Group. We've been in business um, providing water and natural resources services uh, for over seven years. Um, my background is I'm a University of Minnesota graduate, so it's really good to be here. Usually on Fridays, I usually have gopher gear on, but I figured I better dress up, dress up a little bit to come see you all. Um, but um, <clears throat> my career started on the uh, public sector side. So I worked with the Department of Natural Resources and Department of Transportation before going to consulting. And I've been in the industry for, let's just not say there, nearly 30 years. <laughs> and I do have a fresh a sophomore here at the University of Minnesota. Um, my work is really focused on water and natural resources. So we're looking at how to reuse, really we're thinking about that restorative space where you're thinking holistically about the project, the environment that you're gonna impact. So one of our projects is the Reconnect Rondo project, which hopefully most of you have heard about. As we think about putting a lid on the highway or considering that, what other things should we be thinking about environment to make this a place for people to come to be a destination for the people that live there, they're seeing more green as opposed to uh, pavement and we're reusing any water that falls there within that community, right? So that's kind of the work that I do, kind of, mostly the work that I do. And I absolutely enjoy what I do. So um, I came to water from my time living in Liberia, West Africa with my grandmother. So seeing the process she went through just made, left a an impression on my heart, 
which then when I came here, I knew it was something I needed to do, right? So water is my passion, water is what I do. And anybody who's in civil water resources, let's talk after. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Stockness. I'm the executive director of Freshwater, which is a nonprofit that works with uh, community education, water research, and water policy. Um, by training, I got this place in a, a weird way. I, you know, my dad was like, you're good at science and math. You should do engineering. And I was like, oh, that's going to be so boring. I never want to be an engineer, but I went to University of Missouri, enrolled in engineering, civil and environmental engineering, thinking I would transfer out to something else. Um, and then I took a water wastewater class and I was like, oh, this is super interesting to me. Like, this is what I like to do. So I'm a civil engineer, a water wastewater engineer. I was a consultant for 20 years and a vice president on that level, working with a lot of industries and cities on water systems, planning, water supply, water treatment. And I've always had a big sustainability focus. I was LEED certified for a while. Um, I'm Envision certified, which is sustainable infrastructure. So I love that was kind of what I was gravitated towards. So I love that we have this circular economy term and we can talk about that around water because that just makes a lot of sense, right? Who uses water? Who needs it? Where is there too much? Where can you repurpose it? Um, so I focus day to day on water. And um, I think in my experience, a lot of industries are really talking about the circular water economy. And I, and I hope that this can be something that we all talk about across industries too. So glad to be here and uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Sam Hansen, also a U alum, so great to be back here on campus. Uh, I'm the Joint Activities Manager for Ramsey Washington Recycling and Energy, and if you've never heard of that, it's okay. Most people don't know what that is. It's a relatively new organization. It's a joint powers board of the two counties. The short version of the story is Ramsey Washington County have long worked together on a, a variety of different programming, especially in the areas of waste, recycling, things like that. Um, and they formalized that relationship in 2016 by creating what is now Ramsey Washington Recycling and Energy. Um, and so my role there is I, I oversee all of the programs uh, focused primarily on waste reduction, recycling, education um, that the two counties share together. Um, so it's it's been a, an interesting opportunity to to really uh, see programs develop and, and interact with businesses, with communities, with residents. Um, and my pathway to get there, um, as you can see, I, I don't have a, a science back or environmental degree or anything like that. Instead, I, after graduating, was in AmeriCorps for a while, and then uh, I worked in nonprofits ex exclusively for uh, all the way up until I was hired here at uh, Ramsey Washington r &E for short. Um, but instead, I've, I've tried to infuse kind of my interest in the environment into all of the work that I'd, I've done. Um, I also have, I still have a LEED certification, even though I've never worked in the, the, the built environment at all. Um, so it's, it's interesting because I, I think that there's a lot of things within the circularity conversation, sustainability conversation, where um, absolutely you, you need uh, technical experience and background and knowledge. And then there's a lot of things that we all can do. Um, and I think being a generalist and knowing kind of uh, what your impact is on the world around you is, is really important. And I think that's played into my career now of at being at r &E and and trying to help folks understand what their impacts can be and how we can all do better. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, so our next question is one we asked all of our students and faculty in our program, and it's in one to two sentences, define circularity or what a cir circular economy looks like. Two sentences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no pressure. A one or two sentences. To me, in the building industry, circular economy is compliance with a European standard. I think it's 15978. Uh, it's the modules that address uh, embodied carbon across industries. So uh, in addition to that standard, it's, it's currently being incorporated within a building standard, which then can be adopted by code which also aligns with the same modules of embodied carbon from mining, construction, manufacturing, transportation, use, uh, and maintenance, as well as end of life and reuse. That is the definition of embodied carbon and circular economy to me. 
to get creative up here. It's moving this around. Um, circularity to me um, and how we look at it in our space at the office and other things like that is the water that falls. Historically, we've been looking at trying to get it off site as quickly as possible and someplace else, right? Is truly capturing it, reusing it, and thinking about other ways to use it in your current built environment, right? As opposed to drawing it from someplace else where you're, you know, putting a well in or something else, but really using the raindrop that falls where it is in that space. So trying to figure out every way you can reuse that water instead of displacing it and moving it someplace else. I'll stay on the water theme here. Um, to me, circular water water economy means you're reusing every drop of water to its fullest potential, right? So it's not a waste water. Um, if, if you're using it for something, you then treat it and use it for a different source and you keep it in the watershed, not sending it downstream to get away. Um, and I think, you know, this is this makes sense to kids. I, I was at Future City Competition. Have you ever seen that? It's sixth through eighth graders designing future cities. And, you know, I asked them about their water systems and they're like, well, yeah, we, we reuse all the wastewater, like, duh. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> come talk to people with me. Uh, so, you know, it makes a lot of logical sense. There's too much water here. They need more water here. How can you transfer the sources and the uses to the maximum potential? So it sounds simple in concept. Um, it's tricky to do day to day, but um, I think there's real value in it. In not even one, two sentence, maybe even one word, circularity to me is utopia. I mean, it's it's the ideal state. Um, even though I work primarily in solid waste, I think circularity, whether you talk about circular economy or just a circular system that we all live in in general, it just means there is no waste of any kind. And that includes solid waste, but it includes, you know, water is used um, at the highest and best value on the spot that there is no pollution. You know, energy doesn't produce waste in the form of emissions. Um, we value all of the, the health and wellness and resources that we have, um, human capital. So it, it, it's utopia and it's um, ambitious. And I think we have to steadily work towards that one step at a time. Thank you. I'll have to refer back to the recording so we can add this to our long list of definitions. Um, the next question, I'm sure you could all answer, but this is geared towards Beth and Michelle. How do you work across sectors to bridge research, policy, and technology implementation? Yeah, you can have one. Okay. <laughs> no, this is a really exciting question. It's it's what gives me the greatest hope right now. Uh, oftentimes, when I started my career as a mechanical engineer, sustainability was the one-off the additive service that would come in at the end of the project, last minute, oh, we need lead certification. Mm -hmm. uh, let's try to get all the points. And now it is all hands on deck. And I see all industries leaning into the conversation with strength and their own area of power. So to me, what I'm, I'm working on right now, I mentioned this in my one to two sentence earlier, um, for the building industry, there is an organization called ASHRAE. American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. It's a mouthful. Um, but we create the standards. We're all, it's, I think, 52,000 membership internationally. And as volunteers, we understand the importance of giving back to the community and guiding the industry towards its higher purpose, which is creating a sustainable world. So with that, as volunteers, we are creating standards for implementation in the building industry. And I'll get beyond the building, I promise. Um, so the building industry is creating these standards for embodied carbon analysis so that when buildings comply with code, they can document not just the energy they consume from the energy of the electricity or natural gas, but also the greenhouse gas emissions associated with embodied carbon of the materials, structures, substructures. And it's really been prioritized right now uh, on structural engineering. So the embodied carbon of concrete and steel has the statistical importance in total greenhouse gas emissions in the building industry right now. As we have evolved in the HVAC and energy world, we've been able to reduce our emissions so much that net zero operational emissions is feasible. 
where we need to prioritize now is the embodied carbon and the top component of that is structural elements. And in addition, uh, we are also including a methodology for all components to be reported on. So not just structural elements, but interior design. Think of all the equipment that constantly comes in and out of a building that's replaced consistently. So that has a high embodied carbon over a 60 year life analysis. We have MEP systems, so all the mechanical plumbing, all the um, civil infrastructure, all the piping that has embodied carbon as well. So we're really driving a change in the way that we assess building total greenhouse gas emissions. And through that process, we're asking for um, reports from the vendors to document greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll, I'll summarize this quickly. But environmental product declarations are, you know, the reports that our vendors will provide for us to say, this material has less embodied carbon than another vendor or another product. And because we're asking vendors for those, it's giving that market signal to the manufacturers to say, this is important. How can we reduce our total greenhouse gas emissions for our products? And then they go to their manufacturers, their mining, their transportation, their construction, the end of life circular economy. They're taking a look at how can they be market differentiators? Uh, how can they improve their system so that they look promising or you know, incentivizing their product over others? So just one standard from the building industry is driving change from mining, transportation, recycling, circular economy, I mean, everything except for uh, one use bottled plastics. I think that's the only thing we're really not driving change in, but that's what we're looking at holistically. And all of these various industries are leaning into it. So it's not just the mechanical engineer saying this is what we want to do. People are leaning in. So structural engineers have the SE 2050. That's their commitment or collaboration to commit to net zero embodied carbon by 2050. MEP has an MEP 2040 challenge. So that's the challenge of both operational emission reduction and embodied carbon emission reduction by 2040. So all of these areas are coming together um, holistically. And I think that's what I'm working on right now. So I hope you guys are taking that away and kind of building your career off of the good momentum that we have today. Uh, maybe I'll look at it from a bigger picture because I think this this is a great question of how to work across sectors because this is key for the circular economy. The circular economy does not work if you're in your own silo. You will that will quickly uh, fail as a project. So I think it's key to have somebody talking to the community level. What do they want? What do consumers want? What does industry want? What do their shareholders want? What are your shared goals and how can you meet them together? Because you have to work across sectors to have a true circular economy. And so in my mind, that means lots of communication, uh, people that bridge across sectors and can point out alignments and commonalities and how people can work together. Um, in my experience, the attorneys get in the way here. So having some kind of broker of trust, and then you talk about how to manage risks, talk about common terms, but you really need to work across sectors. Um, I think conferences help here and professional associations really help. I've seen conferences just foc on, focus on the circular water economy and they have different types of people they pull together and talk about things. Um, so I think just having an intentionality and listening for those things that can connect to other sectors. Um, one quick example, I was uh, visiting Curita. They're a equipment manufacturer, global equipment manufacturer, and they have a headquarters in Plymouth. And they were like, you know what? We have this diaper recycling technology from Japan what should we do with this? And I, we should talk to you about that. But I was like, oh, you should totally market that here. Like there's a there's a need for that with solid waste reduction, but it's, it's listening for those things and trying to connect across. I think that's a really uh, high need in a uh, circular economy. Thank you. Um, yeah, part of our program, we work, the students work with an artist in residence and engage with community to do the public education and advocacy. So. My next question is about that for Della and Sam. Um, Della, what is what have been some of the most impactful educational programs that your firm has implemented? <clears throat> Did you all hear that? I got one example only. Um, hmm. The most impactful educational program. You know, when you when you originally asked the question, or when I saw the question. 
I wasn't thinking about it in terms of a project and us going to community to talk to community about the project. I thought about it more in terms of the way we um, prepare for and integrate interns into our work and into the future, right? So we can have all these conversations around the circular economy, around reuse and other things. However, if we're not giving you all the opportunity to come in and influence that, and be a part of that and get an understanding of like Michelle's talking about talking to others and engaging with others, we failed, right? So for me and our organization, we spend a lot of time thinking about and planning for interns. So when we bring them on, we're very intentional about the project work that they're gonna do, the community that they're gonna work with, the fact that they have to be listening or some of the things that Michelle just talked about. So if I go into community and I'm going to go lay a road down and all I say is we're coming to lay a road, there's no engagement there, right? But if you're telling them about what does the road mean? How is it gonna impact your life? What are the, the, the materials we're using? If you're bringing yourself away from the technical, the truly technical in terms of I'm a civil engineer, and coming down to I am human, somebody is going to be touching this, being impacted by the, whatever I'm going to do, and helping them get to that place where they understand the need for this and the need for us to be thinking circularly and not wastefully is huge. So we really do that with our interns. So when they come in, we have an understanding of where they are and how they're going to be integrated into our program. And then we help them see the community and how to really engage community, right? We work with and deal with a lot of overburdened communities um, in the environmental justice space, people who have been marginalized. So it's really important that when young people come in or when anybody comes in and they wanna impact those communities, they're thinking about where they've been, right? And how do we help them see the things that we're talking about here? Because what we're talking about here could appear elitist over the heads or other things, but it shouldn't, right? Because this is like Michelle was talking about, if we're talking about future cities, eh, the young people know it, but how do you engage them in their families and all of that when they're dealing with other things? So that's where I think our, our most of our educational programs are. The, the primary one is with our, with our interns and then we do other things, but you told me to just say one. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the same question? Oh. Um, I remember one thing that stood out to me about the R&E board is the goal of having every child in your in the two counties public schools tour your facility. I'm wondering if that's been a successful initiative and what other ways does the R&E board educate the public about waste? Yeah, good question. Um, well, we haven't had every child in the two counties go through. COVID had something to do with that too. Um, we we developed a, a tour space at so I should I guess I should back up so Ramsey Washington Recycling and Energy I mentioned this this Joint Powers Board we have a staff that does programming which is what where where I come in what I oversee but then we also have a facility um, located in Newport Minnesota where all of the solid waste that gets produced in Ramsey and Washington County whether it's residents or businesses um, by law has to go to this facility. And at the facility, we have it's a like a, a giant mouse trap kind of uh, if you know that game from back in the day. All kinds of equipment um, to pull out some materials that they're still values. So pull out some recyclables like metals, some plastics, some uh, fibers, um, and then whatever is remaining gets turned into a fuel that we call refuse derived fuel. So it's essentially the rest of the garbage that gets chopped up. Um, and we process that, we send that to Excel facilities where they incinerate it and uh, produce electricity. Um, the facility has been there for over 30 years, but it was it was always privately owned um, up until 2016 when R&E was created and the counties took control. And in doing that, um, we the counties have invested millions and millions of dollars to try to uh, build up the equipment and the technology to capture more of the value from the waste stream. 
So it's an interesting dynamic because my role is the programs out in communities to try to get people to get waste to the right place at the right time so that it can be recycled, reused, things like that. So it doesn't come to our facility at all. So ultimately, if I'm successful in my job, the facility shuts down. And then my counterpart that runs the facility, they don't have any waste. We're a long ways from that. That's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, so to to try to maximize what we can get out of the waste stream, we've invested in this equipment to pull more plastic out, more fibers out. Uh, we're, we just built a new building to do food processing. So we're now launching a food scrap recycling program that's starting to roll out now. Eventually, uh, it'll be available to every resident that lives in the two counties, regardless of your living situation, um, free of charge, voluntary to, to participate. Um, so that wasn't answering the question, but to give that context, we have this big facility where there's a lot of really cool equipment and a lot of exciting things happening. And one of our goals is to to have tours, especially with um, with young kids, to come through and see the impact. We have windows that look out on what we call the tip floor, where all of the haulers come and dump their waste. And it's the size of, I think it's three football fields or something like that. And it gets filled daily and emptied daily. And seeing the volume of waste and seeing what what's being produced is really impactful. So uh, that tour space has only been around since end of 2019. So we haven't really done a lot of tours because because of COVID, um, but we ramped those up starting last year. And um, now have been, I think last year we gave 100 tours to over close to 1,000 people and hoping to increase that. So children of the two counties, um, you know, especially like grade through three through six is a priority target, but we're open for anybody, whether you live, work in the two counties or somewhere else. Um, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. I think seeing the waste and seeing what goes into it and seeing uh, the impacts, even just on, on people, like the workers that are there and what they have to deal with um, can make a big impact. And then that really feeds into that educational component of understanding um I think it's really common for people to throw something in the trash can and think, oh, it's gone. It goes away. And one of our actual educational messages is what is away or where is away? And if you come to the facility, that's that's one of the places that's away and you can see it all together. Um, so it, it provides a lot of opportunity to really engage people of of the impacts of the choices they make every day. And even if it's one small thing for you, that adds up to be pretty significant overall. Everybody learning a lot like I am. That's awesome. Um, next question is from Mallory, one of our students in the audience. Oh, I'll give you the pass the link. Um, this is directed at Michelle and Sam, if possible. Um, I was wondering how um our industry leaders connecting with government spaces, um, and then also is your work being like translated? Uh, to other states or regions regarding circularity? Yeah, good question. I think this sort of circularity is happening in every state. Some are more ahead than others. Uh, I think we're doing a decent job in Minnesota, but I, um, so I, I think states are all kind of watching each other and trying to pick up, oh, that worked over there. Can we try that here? So I, I do think it's happening across the country. But um, in terms of industry leaders and governments, you know, I think they are connecting. Um, and I, I don't know if you mean like private industry or just uh, industry uh, leaders, but um, I think the best ways I see that is government setting goals and targets that they want people to meet. And then that kind of drives the uh, work that's done at a um, site level, project level to meet those goals. So I think that's one good way to connect. And I think also um, the best way I see for industry and government to work together is grants and funding providing funding, providing grants, saying this is what we think is important. We're going to give you money to do it because we think it's that important. And so I see that coming through a lot. Or or industries are, you know, in my world, that means cities or private companies saying, we really want to do this, but we can't afford it. A lot of times with the circular water economy, I'll say people want to do it, but it adds more dollars to their project and then it gets cut in the end, which is a bummer. So if there's kind of extra funding that can come from the government or someone else to signal that they support these things, these are important and will also help provide funding. I think that's, you know, helping government inform how they fund things and then 
which is, which is maybe policy work. And then um, industries using that funding to implement their own, their own projects. I think that's a good way for them to work together. Yeah, great question. And I 100% agree with what Michelle just said. Um, and I think it also stems to something you said for a previous question about that engagement too, of there has to be meaningful engagement across across the board, but in, including between government and private and public. Um, and because I think probably everybody here has, has heard something about government uh, gets in the way of innovate or government. And sure, that can be very true. Um, I think in order to, to support innovation, government needs to be engaged with business to understand what, what needs to happen. As long as we live in a capitalist society, innovation and money will drive um, so much of what happens. And government, I don't think, should be in the, the business of subsidizing indefinitely innovation, but I think it is a spark to Michelle's point of understanding what industry needs based on maybe some of those goals or policies that government is in, in charge of, of setting, and um, but then also understanding what it's going to take to get there. And I think that there is definitely value in, in funding grants um, to to spur that innovation. And then once uh, once business finds a way to make that profitable long term, that's where that sustainability happens long term. And that's what will drive moving more towards circularity. And then same with like the policy piece, because that's where government comes in is set, set policies, set goals that others have. But we can't do that in a way that is out of touch with what society is telling us, both what private industry needs and is able to do in a cost effective way, but also consumers like what what are consumers asking for? What um, what's going to get them to, to change their habits uh, or what's driving their decisions as far as products? So it really does come, in my opinion, comes down to um, meaningful engagement and also engagement in a way that um, there's empowerment there. It's meaningful in the sense of it's not just listening and then going back and doing the same thing that you had planned to do anyway, like <laughs> really being open to getting that feedback and then taking it to, to guide the decisions and, and make changes that's going to benefit all of us. Great. I'm hogging it. Uh, I'll add one thing. I think the university is a great mediator between industry and government because a lot of times government will say, we want to do this but they need a study or some kind of research to say this is possible as a, you know, a private industry can come and say, we want to do this, but it's nice to have a uh, university research or something to back up that claim. And it adds credibility to whatever the thing is trying to happen. So. Um, next question is for Della, what skills or knowledge should faculty be providing their students to solve complex challenges? Oh, I'm <laughs> I absolutely love this question because I think, you know, we do a really good job of, of teaching theorems and proofs and all this stuff where we give you a question and there is a definite solution at the end, right? Or there is one solution. That's not the real world. I want critical thinkers. I want you all to help them be thinking critically and asking a lot of questions, recognizing that there's no one answer that's the best answer, right? Because if I come into the room, I have my, um, you know, obviously my educational background, but I also have um, bias, baggage, whatever, all the things that I've learned along the way, right, that will help me inform this, and so do you. But if you come in and you think that there's only one math, one way to do it, We've lost all that innovation, all that creativity, diversity, and all of that stuff um, because you're only thinking about it one way. So I want people, I want the university to teach our young people to be more critical thinkers because a lot of times when I get interns, they want me to tell them what to do. And I'm looking at them like, guess what? If you've never been empowered before, you're truly empowered in this space. I will give you the background information for you to understand what we're trying to accomplish, but my expectation is that you're gonna add value to this, right? Because if not, 
we're just creating technicians and robots that have lost their, um, you know, the, the, the spark, that one thing that they should be adding to this. Right. So I'll say critical thinking, that's the really big thing because it's, it's huge to me and you all are, I mean, everybody out there, whoever is listening and everything, we have so many amazing things to contribute to a, a, a problem. We're talking about reuse or cir circularity. I have my thoughts. Beth has her thoughts. Michelle has hers. So does Sam. Can you imagine if we all came to it with one approach? It'd be a very gray environment, right? Let's bring some color to it. That's my, my suggestion. Um, next question is from Robin, who I think is online. Uh, it's for Beth. She asks, in, an eff in efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, how are those emissions quantified or estimated? And what are the strengths, limitations of those methods? And do they differ according to particular greenhouse gases being measured? There's, there's no. more too, but I'll cut it off. No. Um, so that is exactly what the standard we're trying to develop. It's, we've spent, because of the urgency of climate change action, we in our society understand how deeply critical that guidance is and how it's needed right now. So what usually takes four years to create a standard or more, uh, we compiled in nine months with an international group of subject matter experts. Um, and we are documenting the methodologies and the required reporting for holistic life cycle analysis of buildings over a course of 60 years. So that's including all of the guidance around how does one quantify the greenhouse gas emissions from, you know, any structure or substructure. I would also say this is something I kind of added. I'm not, we don't have enough information, but I put a placeholder in it uh, for this conversation around water and wastewater because oftentimes when we talk about buildings, uh, we can quantify the energy from the site and the source from electricity or natural gas, propane, whatever, whatever it is. What we don't quantify is the greenhouse gas emissions associated with water and wastewater as utilities. However, we could not find enough research to document what is a standard greenhouse gas emission per unit from wastewater, there's so many different processes. It's not just the energy they consume on their sites, but their processes that are so varied by regions. Um, so that was a void that we saw, but um, we are actively pursuing some research to see what we could generate across North America as examples. And the intent of it is for these standards to be used internationally. And I will say that it is very North American centric because that's the research that we have to reference, but we are hundred percent open to our partners around the world to providing us with their values that may be different from what we've presented as an option for quantification of greenhouse gas emissions. And so what we've put in the standard is these are baseline values if you don't have guidance, but if your authority having jurisdiction has a different methodology, they have authority. And so in that way, we can account for our variances across nations. It's a very complicated uh, process to ensure that it's holistic and that it's quantifiable um, in all circumstances. But you try to lean into what's the basic science? Where is the research? If there's a lack of research, what can you use for now, knowing that it can evolve over time? Kind of that growth mindset or critical thinking, like we know that things will evolve. So we kind of set placeholders for now. Uh, I would say that for the most part, we've relied a lot on the IPCC. So the Internet Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their reports give a lot of guidance around refrigerant emissions um, for energy emissions, substructure emissions. There's a lot there that we can lean on as a guidance. If we know that there's research that's changed, you know, we'll reference it and say, that's a good place but evolving science indicates that this is the methodology. So that's how we're working on it. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Does anyone have a question from the audience? In the 70s, we required people to start thinking about environmental impact in an explicit way. In the 80s, under the Clinton administration, we required people to start thinking about 
um, environmental justice explicitly. In the 90s, we started requiring value engineering on all significant projects. When are we going to have a comparable requirement for circularity? And what is it going to require that we do to see that happen? I guess that's a question probably for Della. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow i wasn't expecting that one did you guys see me i was just like oh he's gonna punt it to michelle um oh i don't know um so your question is really around when are we going to start requiring circularity in um now right to be considered and i think to be honest with you Unfortunately, we think about things like that when they're pain points, right? When, um, when you don't have place to put waste, then you think about it, right? Then you're like, oh, let's think about creative ways to use this. When you have water um, that you need and you've got wastewater and you've got to think creatively about how to reuse this thing, treat it or do something else with it, then you think about it. Unfortunately, that's where we are. We're reactive. And I think that's kind of where my thoughts are is for everybody that's coming out of school, if you're thinking critically and you're being, you will be in that proactive seat where we don't have to wait to be governed by a directive, but that's really how we think. And we'll, it'll be a groundswell movement. That's, that's my Pollyanna yes. hope, but that's where it is. It's, it's driven by pain points in the initial, but all of us can help affect change by requiring it and including it. Do you have something on that? Oh, yeah. Maybe I'd add to something. I wish we could get there. That would be great. Uh, these, in my, what I've seen is these things kind of come from the community level up. It's not like a top-down thing that doesn't seem like it would work. But I think sometimes what I've seen in the circular economy is different people you're working with use different language for this oh, we like the circular economy. And then when you ask for a definition for it, like you said, there's 30,000 definitions. So I think trying to speak the same language as the people you'd be working with in the circular economy, kind of standardizing that and getting everybody on the same page. I know when I talk about water reuse, depending on the community I'm in, I talk about leadership in the environment, not sustainability, because I can't use that word. So like there's, you know, you have to somehow get all on the same page um, and have it be a community-led need. And then I think from there, then government or whoever else is setting goals can go from there, but that helps. Did anyone else? Uh, thank you for being here. I've been learning a lot. Excuse me. Uh, so the question that I do have, I think it's related up to the back end of circularity because I think we've been talking a lot about waste and how to manage that. But I'm more like curious on not having the resources we do need more towards the scarcity end. Um, and I'm kind of like wondering, especially with the fact that we're looking into like 2050 and making sure that we're meeting all the right standards. Um, but like Beth mentioned, we always seem to, I guess in the past, we have always tailored the sustainability end more like towards the back end. But I'm kind of like wondering, how do we make sure that the efforts that we're putting in today actually is going to be relevant in the future? How can we make sure that we're not actually complicated things more by actually trying to put our input in using all the resources that we have to make sure that we're using them in the right way? I don't know if I'll have the... You, you all have a better answer probably, but um, I think human beings are great at innovation and creativity and finding solutions, but also we're great at making problems at the same time sometimes. Um, and I, th I think I think at the core of your question, it's a great question. Um, and it's, I think, hard to predict in some ways. I think Beth and I were talking before the, the panel started of just the the cycle of innovation and then uh, how the benefits of new innovation, new products, how the how society can benefit from say lightweighted plastic. Now we can have convenient food that's safe to eat and travel, but then you also have waste. Um, and I think that there's 
there has been this cycle and will continue to be the cycle of innovating to try to solve a problem, but not necessarily having the, the foresight of what kind of challenges that innovation also creates. And then the challenge of having the end solution try to catch up with that innovation. Um, because I think that's also an always an ongoing process of, all right, we have this issue, whether it's a solid waste, wastewater, something else, um, apply this solution now, but then as things change, how do we tweak the solution to then catch up? So it, I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I think it, it is a, a, a challenge that will continue for a, a long time. And that's where that creativity, crit critical thinking, innovation comes into play. But I think, again, more engagement on both sides from the beginning will really help. So as, as you know, private industry is innovating, developing new products, also being engaged in that system to understand what systems are in place already to, to manage or what kind of uh, concerns we might have with that product or with the emissions created through the development of the product, um, the more and more of that kind of engagement kind of closes the loop on the side of, of development innovation that hopefully will limit some of those challenges at the end. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it'll ever be fixed. <laughs> I don't think I have an answer to your question because it is just so far out there that it's like, wow, right? Because in actuality, a lot of the things that we're developing, we're thinking about is to fulfill a short-term need or a short-term issue, right? We're not thinking holistically about the potential impacts of whatever it is we're doing, right? We create this new thing and it's like, oh, this is awesome. But we never follow it to say, okay, how may it impact this? How may it impact this? In the next 30 or 40 years, forever chemicals or whatever, how may it impact this, right? And maybe that's the approach we need to be thinking about and looking at as we approach things. Because as Sam said, you know, or maybe I'm interpreting, um, as humans, we kind of get in this thing and we're, we're in this space for comfort just to make it work right away, right? But there are such far reaching impacts and the idea that everything's here for us to do whatever we want to do with, there needs to be a shift in that thinking and think about it from a different perspective in terms of this is a living thing that we're a part of and we need to coexist and not dominate, right? And then if we are going to think about some things in terms of innovation or whatever, what's the entire cycle of it? Where does it end? Is it going to tra transform into something else? That's where you smart people come in. Like, I may be thinking, this is awesome. You could come back and say, not so much in the next 30 years if it's connected to X, right? So, um, so yeah, really amazing question and something we need to think a lot about as we move through this space. Oh, you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, in the nature of time, I have one more question for all of you. Um, what's the best nugget of advice you'd give to graduate students who want to contribute to this work? I would say oftentimes, and this is going to be a general statement, so I'm not trying to offend, but engineers go into engineering because it's very comforting to know there's a correct answer at the end. It's not like the arts where it's subjective. Uh, we come into this because we know there's a concrete path and that there's a solution. And that's what we're kind of driven to achieve. What is the solution? There's a problem. What's the answer? I would say for graduates in the engineering field today, it's whole systems thinking. It's not one problem, one solution. It's collaboration. Um, in the building world, we talk about integrative design, where we bring our structural engineers, MEP, architects, interiors, everyone to the table to talk about what is the goal? What are we trying to achieve? There's many different paths to get there. What's the best solution as a whole systems thinking outcome? In climate change or in circular economy, it's, it's that kind of mentality of collaboration, but 
you know, we're working with wastewater industry buildings. We're talking about recycling. We're talking about mass transportation. It is whole systems thinking across the community and trying to find those regenerative solutions. It's not your, here's my problem. I'm going to solve this alone. Look out, look at how are you impacting the broader community at large beyond the boundary of your individual project or work. And I, I, that's what I would recommend because that's how we all work together to find solutions as a community. Yeah, I would agree. Um, it feels like I'm on a soapbox, so I'm gonna try to get off. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, Beth talked about collaboration. I spoke earlier about critical thinking, but at the, the core, it's just flexibility, right? There's so much rigidity in this space. Like, we know this, we're siloed, we've gotta be in this space. Just be flexible to grow, to hear new things and say, hmm, maybe the way I thought about that, maybe I could think about that a little differently. Hmm, maybe I should bring some other people to the table so we can think about this in a whole new way. Just be flexible, all right? We'll add something different. Um, agree with both those statements. Communication is really the key. You work in teams all the time. You need to effectively communicate. You need to present what you're talking about and not put everybody to death. So uh, even though it sucks, take those public speaking classes and those communication classes and just like, I will keep taking them till the day I die because it's a very, very useful skill and it really helps teams work better, better projects, better solutions. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with everything all three of you said completely. All of that is incredibly important. I guess maybe what I would say is kind of doubling down on a few things that Della said just about critical thinking, also collaboration um, and curious, be curious. I ask questions. I think it's, at least in my experience, you know, it's it can be hard moving from the student to the professional world and being new in your field. And the person who's been there says, we can't do that. And here's what, you know, ask questions, push back, be curious, think of solutions. There's the, the solutions of the world have not all been developed yet. Like we, we still need to innovate. We still need to create and we need all of the thoughts, all of the great ideas that everybody here and everywhere else has. So I'd encourage everybody to ask questions, push back when somebody says no, don't start with no is the answer. Start with what will this take? What would it take? Is it possible? And be curious and be creative and, and be adaptable. Uh, thanks so much for being here.